we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here to start their summer road trip. Uh, I know some have already looked uh, at some of the MTCs have started their summer road trip. <laughs> but we're glad you are starting with us. Then we're going to be talking about your spiritual journey and uh, your road trip with, with God and how to do a great job of preparing and growing spiritually. So I want to start by telling you a story. A uh, priest uh, gets on the airplane, sits next to a man. It is uh, after a short discussion, they realize their first uh, trip on a uh, inter, uh, intercoastal international uh, flight of any, actually a flight of any kind. They had never flown before. And so they are nervous, of course, the takeoff, a little scary. Uh, they get up in the air. Once they get to the 35,000 feet, the pilot comes on, tells them they're 35,000 feet. And uh, they're both uh, a little shaky about that, way up in the air. And uh, so uh, they don't say much to each other. Uh, the stewardess uh, announces that they're going to be serving drinks, and uh, they start their process. And so the man, to break uh, the tension a little bit, he uh, nudges the father. He says, uh, Father, uh, if it's okay, you know, when they come by here, I'll, I'll buy you a drink. You know, it'll make it'll calm you down a little bit, me as well, buy us both a drink. And uh, the priest turns to him and says, uh, no, no, thank you. He says, uh, I'm a little bit too close to the home office right now. <laughs> so maybe on this journey, we're going to get close to the home office. I hope we do. And uh, I want to talk to you specifically about uh, planning this trip, this journey that we're going to take. So we're going to start with our sticky statement of the day. And that is that discipline always results in progress, even when you have a bad attitude. How many of you know that to be true? Discipline always, always results in progress, even when your attitude is not what it should be, right? You're always going to have uh, a, a good outcome if you discipline yourself. Now, what is discipline? Discipline is, is doing the right thing now, you know, uh, so uh, even though it may be painful, it may be hard, so that you can do what you want to do later. You know, sacrificing right now, doing without or or doing something that maybe you don't want to do, but you need to do, needs to be done, so that later you can have uh, some free time and really enjoy yourself. Now, the kind of discipline that I want to talk to you about today is centered around a decision, making a decision to, to carve out time in your day, each day, for God. Making a decision to carve out time for God in your daily life, to make room for Him in your daily life. Now, here's what I want uh, for you to do uh, at the beginning. The things that, you know, I want you to understand that the things that we discipline ourselves to do today can really become the joys of tomorrow. It doesn't always seem that way, but I remember a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, a neighbor actually across the street, was training for his first uh, marathon, you know, run and uh, so he was getting up early and I would encounter him because at the time I was, uh, I was helping, I was working at Starbucks and I was getting up at like really early in the morning and this guy was, you know, uh, getting up and he had his, his flashlight on his headband light, uh, stretching in his front yard, getting ready and was running. And so after this had gone on for several months, I happened to, to run into him uh, in his front yard one day and, and I had to ask him about this new a part of his life about running and I said tell me about the discipline of running and and what has this been like for you because every day he's getting up you know at five in the morning and, he, and he's running 10 to 15 miles for four times a week actually and uh, it and I said that's incredible it's incredible the discipline I said tell me about it so he says well first of all I have to be honest with you and say it was really really difficult the getting up part was the hard thing you know and then getting through those first few miles, hitting that, that wall of pain and everything. But he said, I have to tell you, seven, eight months now into this, that I cannot imagine my life without running four times a week, 10 to 15 miles a day. Now, that really surprised me when I heard it. He talked to, began to talk to me about the joy of this discipline. This discipline in his life had been so life-changing and so enjoyable that he said, I cannot imagine. He says, I get up even a little earlier uh, now than I did before because I'm anticipating the fun of this discipline. So most of us can't imagine a discipline ever being fun. But in truth, when we begin to practice these disciplines, they really become 
the joy of our life. And we do see um, life change taking place in us. So what I want you to do this morning is I want you to listen closely as we go through scripture passages, as we talk about some of these steps to helping us carve out time for God in our daily lives. And I want you to listen in particular for things that raise the hairs on the back of your head, things that ruffle your feathers a little bit, things that you say, I don't know if that's true or not. Okay, so I want you to listen for those things as I talk to you this morning. And the reason why is because I believe those are the areas that we need to think about growing in our lives. Those are the challenging areas of our life that I think we need to leave here ready to address. Those are the real notes for today, right? The things that are ruffling our feathers, the things that just kind of, you know, I don't know if I can do that. The things that are a little bit of a struggle. So I want you to listen for those things as we go through this list today. We're going to take a look in the mirror of God's Word, and we're going to see what we can see spiritually. And our question this morning might be, you know, what would we see if we could see ourselves spiritually? Would we see a starving man, woman? Would we see, um, you know, an almost invisible person? Or would we see uh, what I see when I look in the mirror, Hercules? No, I'm not. <laughs> not really. What would we see if we look into the mirror of God's Word? So let's jump in, and we're going to take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which is, the beginning of the challenge for you and I to have this kind of discipline in our lives. First, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of God. He goes on to say, avoid godless chatter. More about that in the God Talk series in the fall, Okay. We won't cover that today. That's a message all by itself. But the challenge here is that we need to grow and learn God's word so that we can handle it properly, handle it right. Now, planning the trip, uh, developing a, a spiritual growth plan, it all begins with us getting honest about ourselves. It's looking in the mirror and seeing what we really see. My wife and I have been um, recently uh, addicted to a, a show that uh, we just ran into here by chance, My 600-Pound Life. Have you guys? <laughs> Anybody seen My 600-Pound Life? And it's, uh, it, it, it really, you know, it, it's, it is some, it's something to see. Uh, but you cannot imagine that someone could go this far before uh, it's, it's actually the alarm bells are kind of going off and it's time to, to do something, you know? And yet all of us, if we're honest, when we look in the mirror, are much, are that far or much further in areas of our lives that we have not been real honest about. In areas of our lives where we have not acted in, in truthfulness and honesty about what is going on with us. It might be uh, our, our propensity towards pornography, or it might be our propensity towards telling the truth to someone, or it might be uh, something uh, in, in character that we're struggling with in our lives. But many of us have the same kind of thing going on, but it's easier for us to point at something very visible in somebody else's life than it is for us to get honest about what's going on in our lives, right? It really is quiet in here. <laughs> so we want to begin by identifying where we are. And the question is, you know, are you a seeker, um, a follower, you know, or are you a believer disciple? That's the big question for us to take a look at. But let's look at this passage of scripture out of James chapter 1, verse 22. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. You see yourself, you walk away, you forget what you look like. He said we have to become those that put the word into practice. Now, if we are looking at what it is to be and we've talked about this over the last year, the difference between being 
a seeker, follower of Jesus, and crossing the line to being a disciple believer in Jesus Christ and practicing the Word of God. That's the real difference. It is putting into practice in our lives this journey, this walk, this calling of God. Our purpose really begins when we connect with Jesus Christ and we begin to put the truths of God into action for ourselves. Truth never set anyone free. It is the truth that you believe and practice that liberates you and sets you free, right? And so in a follower uh, mentality or seeker, there's nothing wrong with that. And we have many, you know, we have some that attend here, but many that I've met over my life who are seekers and followers of Jesus. They really like uh, the things about uh, Jesus that they hear and, and, and understand. They really do uh, love the community of faith, the, the church uh, opportunities to come together and be with people. They love the worship songs. There's a, there's a lot of pluses about hanging out in the group. But they haven't crossed the line yet because they're still struggling with, uh, you know, searching to whether they can really believe God. They're looking for reasons to believe God, for anchor, to anchor themselves. And they still have questions. We went through the critical questions uh, class that Zach taught recently, and, and one of those was, you know, if, if there is a God, why is there suffering in the world? And so these things trouble people who are just kind of tagging along the backside. They're in that big multitude group that Jesus talked about in the Bible where... They were in that great big... Uh, multitude group, and if you remember that group that Jesus taught and fed at one minute, a couple of occasions there, the 4,000, the 5,000 people that Jesus fed, in that concentric circle were people on the front lines, in the middle, and at the back. And these are, these are the guys that are kind of hanging out the back. And they can't hear real well, uh, you know, because they're so far back. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And one of the guys goes, did Jesus say blessed are the cheesemakers? He said, No. No, I don't think so. They're back there. They're listening because they, they are there. That's big. That's huge. They're there. They're in the group. They're followers. They, they like the things they hear. But they really just haven't crossed the line yet because all of the evidence is not in yet as far as they're concerned. And so you have followers that they attend church occasionally. They're still wrestling with, uh, you know, bedrock beliefs of faith, and, and, they, and they, want to, they want to have more convincing evidence before they can cross the line. But it's great that they're there, and you love it because they're there. The second group you might be in is those who are disciples or believers, followers of Jesus. They love and trust Jesus uh, with their whole life. And they're trying to exemplify that, characteristics of those who are disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. They're growing in their understanding uh, of their relationship with, with Jesus on a day-by-day -day basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. They are eager to get into classes and to learn more and to grow more, uh, to find out more about Jesus. They're becoming more comfortable with uh, the spiritual disciplines of prayer and reading the Word on a daily basis. They're, they're becoming more comfortable with what we talked about last week, which is expressing themselves with their body about worship. You know, the, the, we were taught in the video, remember, the, the, the beginning of, of the signals for, you know, and if you're in a hand-raising church and you start out, you know, you might start out here with carry the TV. You know, then the big screen TV. And then I, I caught a fish this big. And then, you know, the, the baby. Uh, I'm holding the baby. The Mufasa one or the baby, either one. Remember he said, they're beginning to be more comfortable with that. And you're looking around, you're going, yeah, they're, so, I'm, I feel okay about this now. They're crossing the line. One by one, they're beginning to believe that it's okay and they have permission to advance and to move forward. Disciple uh, in Jesus be coming uh, is really about be coming to a place where you are uh, following him, listening to him, obeying him on a daily basis. Here's what uh, is said in John 14 and 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And this is exemplary of those who are disciples of Jesus. Not that they don't ever fall down or make mistakes or sin but that the pattern of their life is to get back up, ask for forgiveness, and continue to follow and obey and listen to Jesus, okay? So step number one, identify where you're at. 
be honest, be brutally honest. Where am I in my spiritual growth? Am I cold? Am I on fire? Am I hot? What needs to happen here based on where I am? So the second thing that happens, the second step is to ask God to identify where you need to grow in your faith. Ask God for help. Where do I need to grow in my faith? Luke chapter uh, 18 verse 8 says, When the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Now there are a lot of people right now struggling with their faith. A lot of millennial Christians who are really struggling in their faith because they're being challenged in culture. Now this is nothing new, but you know we've seen it throughout the history of mankind, but they're being challenged in, in some interesting ways in culture today to buy into certain things that the culture wants them to believe. I, I heard something kind of disturbing recently at a church in Oklahoma where the pastor uh, in a uh, denomination I'm very familiar with got up to speak on a particular Sunday and addressed a difficult subject. And, he, and as he was preaching about that difficult subject, a handful of people in that congregation got up and walked out on him, just left. And it was even astonishing to some of the people who had gone to the church for a long time because these were clear biblical values and biblical truths that he was teaching about. But these people that left were no longer willing to abide by them. They had been neutralized in culture. So there, I think there's two reasons why many are confused about what they believe today and as Christians. And the number one thing is they're biblically uneducated. They're biblically uneducated. And when I was growing up, we had a lot of opportunities for biblical education. It didn't mean everyone took advantage of them, but we had Sunday school. We had, you know, just a number of opportunities throughout the week. We had a number of services that people would come to. We've gone to kind of weekend services, and it's not been because churches are lazy and they don't want to teach people, but it's been because when I was growing up, you know, moms did not work. They stayed home. And uh, not yeah, they could if they wanted to, but... Many of them didn't, and what that meant was that they had a full-time job at home, and everything was prepared and ready, and it was easy for the family to go to church. It was easy for them to go to Sunday night. It was easy for them to go to Wednesday night because everything was done at home. Now moms and dads are both working hard. They're challenged to keep up and pay the bills, and now when, they, uh, when weekends come around, everything that they would have normally have tried to accomplish during the week is right there on the weekend. You've got to do laundry. You've got to do homework. You've got to get prepared for the next week. Grocery shopping, everything. Have you ever gone to HEB on Sunday? It's a madhouse, isn't it? It didn't used to be that way, but it is now. Things have changed, so the church had to change and make some adjustments so that it could meet the people where they're at in culture. But what it's resulted in is a lack of of biblical education and a lot of people just don't know it doesn't sound quite right they don't understand and so we're going the extra mile to try to help you understand through Grace Place University and I want to encourage you to sign up for as many of those classes you can come to we are going to continue that on and on to try to educate and to encourage we are putting some of those on video so you can at your spare time you can go see that on our YouTube account and see some of the classes that we teach. The second thing, the second reason is that there's, uh, we're being culturally corrupted. And it is one of those things where the world is in lockstep about certain things, and they expect that all the rest of us be in lockstep too. Are you going to believe a book that's 2,000 years old, or are you going to believe what man has come to understand about how man gets along with each other? Come to the table and agree with all the rest of us. This is what we believe, and this is what you should believe too. And so, in many cases, Christians are falling into cultural corruption. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, God said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. What do we need to do as a result of this? We've identified what's going on in our life. We're asking Jesus to help us learn what he, uh, what he has to say is truth and follow him in that leading. The third step here is we need to identify what you need to learn. 
There are three big questions that we want to ask when we're trying to identify what we need to learn to grow forward. Here they are. Where am I struggling in my Christian walk? What keeps coming up over and over and over again? That's something that needs to be addressed. Secondly, who will I make my accountability partner? We're going to talk more about that in a minute. And the third one is, see step two and get started. <laughs> it's time to begin to put it into action. There's nothing like for getting something done like doing it. You got to get up. My friend had to get up that first morning, stretch out, and make that first run, or he wouldn't have done that for a year long and prepared for that marathon. Step number four, identify what you need to do, to do. And this is important to us because it sounds similar to maybe the, than some of the other steps, but here is where we draw the line on it. In James chapter 2, verse 18, I can already hear it says, one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good, you take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith fit together hand in glove from the message. Faith and works, works and faith fit together hand in glove. The truth is that nothing is liberating us until we begin to act in it. I can read on the side of, of, a, of, you know, a package of my favorite, you know, food that there are millions of calories in it, you know, and uh, I can say, wow, maybe I should eat less of that, or I can continue to consume what I would like to consume, and that is my decision, so the truth doesn't change my weight, right? <laughs> but when I put the truth to action, it changes my weight. I can drop pounds by understanding the truth and acting on it, right? That's how we change. Step number five, write out the plan for your spiritual growth. We're told in Habakkuk 2 and 2, then the Lord replied, talking to Habakkuk, uh, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the uh, herald may run with it. In other words, make this so simple that you can begin to act on it. Make it so simple that you can carve out time in your daily life for Jesus Make your plan so simple and understandable that you can, you can do it in your sleep. You don't need to make an Excel sheet, right? You don't have to complicate this. Just make it simple. Put the reminders up on your mirror. Put the reminder up on your, on your icebox or refrigerator. You know, make sure that you have uh, a reminder for what you're going to be doing. Now, here are the things that you should, your plan should include. If you're a seeker, and a follower, if you're kind of still checking this thing out, here are four quick steps for you. Begin by attending worship service weekly. Start coming regularly. There are only 52 Sundays in the whole year. A very small percentage of your life, an hour, an hour and a half gathering, where you're going to get taught about God and about growth. If you carve it down to just 12 once a month, there's not much growth going to happen. If you were going into training and you only went to training one time a month, by the time you came back the next month, you would have forgotten everything they taught you the first month, right? And we need to make a commitment. So let me encourage you to do that. Secondly, attend uh, Grace Place University class 101. We give you a Bible if you don't have one. We start from the very beginning and we teach you how to use the Bible, how to understand the Bible. There's a class coming up. You can sign up for it online at gpaustin.com uh, forward slash classes and you can get enrolled in that and come. It's free. There's no cost and we are going to walk you through how to begin in God's Word, okay? The third thing I would like to ask you to do is to, is to sign up for the Discover Grace Place class. It's where we begin to introduce you to the leadership, the family of the church, talk about the history, uh, the present, and the future where we're going. We're offering one of these in September, and that'll be up uh, pretty quick. Uh, we'll be showing you slides on that and encouraging you to jump in on that class. You can sign up also for that at the same site there. And the last one is we want you to take a step of faith, right? Begin. Just get started. Get started. Take a, a big step of faith for your life as a follower and just say, hey, I'm going to take a chance. 
and I'm going to make this one step and see if God will meet me there. Whatever that step is for you, if that step is, is, is just, you know, coming to worship service and starting out with the carry the big TV, whatever it is for you, take that first step and see if God won't meet you there. If you're a believer and a disciple, here are some steps I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to first serve. Serve. If you haven't been serving anywhere, uh, helping out in church, involved in any of the things that we have going on here at the Grace Place or involved in community service, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to get involved. I want to help you. I'll talk to you about how you can get involved and you can serve. You're going to grow exponentially when you start serving. When somebody threw a Sunday school book at me when I was about, I don't know, 15, 16 years old and said, we need a teacher for this class, I grew incredibly over the next year preparing lessons and learning to teach these, these young junior high boys, man, and they were challenging. But uh, I learned and I grew so much as I began to serve and I began to help others out. The second thing is, is commit to praying on a daily basis. Commit to asking God, talking to him, spending time as present. It's not, don't start off worrying about the quantity. I have to spend an hour every day. Worry about the quality of just you and God, not you and 14 distractions. You and God, just a few minutes. Spend some time with him and call on him. The third thing, committing to, to your daily devotions. Committing to opening the word of God, reading the word of God, listening to uh, podcasts, to sermons. I listen to a lot of this during the week. I want to encourage you to go to our site uh, and, and listen to the messages over again. You always get more when you listen the second, third, fourth time to messages. There's some that I have listened to three, four, five times, and, and each time they minister to me and help me out. There is such a, 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 a lot of information, a lot of good communication available on, the, on uh, what God would have to say to our lives that we can tune into on a weekly basis. Then I want to encourage you to get involved. Get to know the church family, the people that are around you. Attend worship regularly and participate in, uh, if you haven't already, the Grace Place University. Continue to go to those classes as they come up. And last step for us, the sixth step, make yourself accountable. I told you we revisit this to someone for the plan that you are forming for your spiritual growth and development. Make yourself accountable to somebody. Start looking around the room. Who am I going to be accountable? <laughs> who, who, who are we going to be accountable to? I want to give you two points of direction. Two points of direction for looking for an accountability partner, okay? First of all, spiritually mature disciples in Jesus Christ. Please, please, please. Please, please, please. <laughs> Do not make your accountability partner somebody who is not a mature Christian, somebody who is struggling in their own walk, somebody who is involved in religion and not relationship with Jesus Christ, somebody who really doesn't know if they believe in God. Do not make them your spiritual accountability partner. Find, there are too many good ones out there. Find someone who loves God, who exemplifies the character that he talks about. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering. They're not perfect people. But you know them to be people who have crossed the line, who are disciples, who love Jesus with their whole heart. And Go to those people. The second thing, the second quality that they need to have is the availability and the willingness. And it doesn't do us any good to find a great person who's already got three other people that they're watching over, plus their own lives and their family and stuff like that. And they are so busy that they cannot give us the time that we're going to need to grow and to develop, right? So go after someone and ask them if they would be willing to help you out. And if they, can, if they can watch over your life and encourage you as you are going to look to them to be your accountability partner and call you out. Haven't seen you in six weeks in church. You know, I just, just wanted to give you a buzz and say, man, I love you. You know, and, uh, you know, I really care about you. What's going on? Can we help? Can we encourage you? What do you need from me? 
Somebody who is going to meet us at our level and encourage me. I've had people like that in my life my whole life, and I am a pastor, and I still have people like that in my life who call me into accountability, who say, hey, you said you were going to do this. How are you doing on it? Uh, not so good. Okay, what's wrong? How can I pray with you? How can I help you? What's happening? And I'll tell you, I have... Uh, the relationship that I have with God today, I have the marriage that I have today, much in part to accountability people who have called me and, and spoke to me in, in all truth and honesty and called me into accountability to live the way that God's called me to live. Having an accountability partner is so great. I want to invite our worship team to come back. Remember our sticky statement for the day, so if you don't take anything away, you don't remember all the six points, it's on video. You can go back and watch it and take notes. But you're going to remember this, that discipline always results in progress, even when you have a bad attitude. Discipline always results in progress. For some people that I'm talking to this morning, they're saying, man, I feel like my life is just is slipping away. It's not being invested. It's like I'm at the same place I was last year. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of just circling this mountain. What can I do? And God is saying, it's, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to grow and to advance and to come forward. Get disciplined. Get disciplined. And it will always result in, in great things. What would change in your life if you took a truthful evaluation about what you look like in God's mirror? What would you change? In that series that Michelle and I were watching, The 600-Pound Life, when they get a real look at, at what is going on health-wise and everything else, and it's so cool to see when they get connected and they really understand that truth and they start making the changes, and you see 100 pounds come off, and then a 95 pounds, and then another 100 pounds, and you're looking at this person thinking, this is so awesome. This is so awesome, but that discipline began. And, and one of the things the guy had them do in the beginning was, was something that just sounds ridiculously simple. Get down on the ground and get back up. Get down on the ground. But you know what? When it's 600 pounds and you get down on the ground, you're lifting 600 pounds back up. And down on the ground and 600 pounds back up. And these people were hurting and they were sweating and they were crying and saying, I can't do this. It's just, it seems like a, a simple thing for you and I. I'm calling us back to look in our mirror and to see what's going on in our lives. And God's saying, get down and get back up. Very simply, obey me. Get down and get back up. I'm going to change your life if you'll obey me, if you follow what I'm calling you to do. Worship team is going to lead us in this song. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to close us in prayer.
在我